And now, the Sunday Sit-Down with Jack Encarnacio. Welcome back to the Sure Dog Radio Network Rewind. I'm Jack Encarnacio. And it's once again time for the Sunday Sit-Down. If all you know about Nick Newell is that he was born without a left hand or most of his left forearm, then you only understand part of what makes him an exceptional athlete. The 8-0 lightweight prospect has used his disadvantage to his advantage in every conceivable way, from the baseball diamond to the wrestling mat to the MMA cage. The 26-year-old is coming off his first clean knockout victory at the end of a knee in August. And on December 7th, he challenges for his first title, the XFC lightweight championship against Eric Reynolds on Access TV. Nick Newell joins us tonight to help us get a fuller understanding of his unique path to this milestone. Nick, thanks so much for joining us on The Rewind. Hey, it's a pleasure to be on the show, man. Very, very good. And uh, I'll so much to ask you about. I'm sure a couple of questions, and I'll try to keep these to a minimum, that you have been asked 6,000 times. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just, I guess, comes with the territory when you have the gift that you have. Um, you've said before, Nick, that because of the condition with your left arm, that you, your shots, in terms of wrestling, have to be closer than those of other wrestlers. And I wonder if you think things like that have made you have to fine-tune your game more than other MMA fighters necessarily have to. Yeah, it does. Um, you know, my, my takedowns have to be that much better. I can't get away with shooting from all the way out because I, I don't have the reach to pull the leg in. And, you know, when I get in on you, it's, it's a lot tighter. And I, I compensate, you know, I don't have... I don't have the the reach, but when I get in, I definitely have the grip. So I, I've between me and my coaches, we've come up with our own system to really help me uh, compete at a very high level. Sure, you mentioned the grip, and that was something I did want to ask you about. I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, but describe over the phone to me and to our listeners over the airwaves as well, sort of what it's like to experience your grip in that left arm. Uh, you know, I grab I grab my arm. Um, my little arm, and I, I, I grab almost ar- around the bicep, and I squeeze. I pinch my elbows, and I squeeze, and it's, it's just a very tight grip from years of wrestling, and, and now you know years of MMA and jujitsu. Does it? Um, can you squeeze and, and grip to the point where it would hurt me, like if I put my hand in there? <laughs> uh, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't. I much- would never try to squeeze your hand if i mean if i put you in a rear naked choke or a guillotine you you're probably gonna you know go to sleep but <laughs> yeah i didn't choose, I know I didn't like didn't choose the best body part yeah well that that's what i was wondering because i don't know maybe you've had training partners or you've had opponents even kind of explain to you what it's like to experience that is it is it different do they do they give you a sense that it's different than training with anybody else or or fighting anybody else or is there really no difference between a you know a Nick Newell rear naked choke or an Achilles lock or 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 a or a heel hook than that of any other fighter I wouldn't say um it's any tighter because of my arm I would say it's tight because of uh, good technique and positioning mm-hmm. more so than anything else I mean the the stuff that I do anyone can do you know you can shoot your arm all the way through and and grab your bicep and get a super tight choke. It's just the way that I have to do it, which makes it tight. So it's not like I have, like, an advantage. I mean, anyone can do it, you know? It's just that I do do it. Yeah, you said an advantage, and, you know, it it struck me uh, as similar to, like, the the Kyle Maynard thing. And, of course, he has, um, you know, he, he had a great wrestling career, and we know he had one amateur MMA fight where his opponents were saying, or the opponents that fell through, you've experienced this as well. At some point, it, it's they consider it an advantage or almost a disadvantage to them to be going up against you because there's just such a different approach. There's just considerations that they can't possibly take into account in preparation until they're actually in the ring or cage with you. What, what do you say to the idea that, in fact, in some ways it's more of an advantage than a disadvantage for you? Uh, I don't put any weight in, into that, and I actually I don't even think about it. I think about the, the moves I can do and the things that you know come easier and the, the best moves for me to do, but when it comes to advantages and disadvantages, I really don't put any weight into that everyone has their things that they can do better and their advantages and disadvantages based on body type the thing is with people that are saying that you know it's just it's just excuses or mm-hmm. you know they find it hard to believe so they're trying to come up with a reason why um 
before to be, to be before clear, I Nick, I'm not doing words, MMA, you, you, before I started doing MMA, it was a huge disadvantage. Oh my God, you're you know that guy's gonna fight. He he can't fight. He's gonna get hurt. He only has one hand. And then you know I start beating people up, and then all of a sudden I'm, I have this major secret weapon advantage. You know, it's just an elbow. I just hit people with elbows, and when I get in on my grip, it's tight. But it's a tight grip that anyone can do. That, that's fascinating. So I wasn't just extrapolating there. That is something you've heard out there from maybe opponents. Oh yeah, or, absolutely. Yeah. Is this something that you get? Um, is this something you started to notice the more you fought and getting on television, or is this something you've heard really from day one in your eight and zero mixed martial arts career? Uh, it was when I started beating people. You know, especially on the local level, no one really wanted to fight me. It was hard for me to get fights. And, you know, they started saying, oh, he's got an advantage, that's why I don't want to fight him. At first it was like, oh, that's a disadvantage. And it's like, well, how come you didn't, how come you didn't fight me when that disadvantage was in the middle and it was turned into an advantage, you know? It's like you just don't want to fight me because you're going to lose. Um, you know, I don't really, I don't really, like I said, I don't put too much weight or really think about it that much. I am the way I am. I don't, I realize, you know, that I'm different. Uh, for training purposes, but I don't like treat myself any different or expect any special treatment or expect to, you know, anything different than what everyone else has. Clearly, and I think it's actually probably a great thing, all things considered, that, you know, you're in a position of having to say it's, it's, it's not an advantage, that you've actually excelled enough in the game and learned the game and taken to the game so well. But that's something people are saying about you instead of, you know, why are you trying to do this? I think that, that that's a testament in and of itself. But before we get too far down that road and we talk too much about um, your, your congenital uh, issue with your arm, how do you feel about, at this point in your career, talking about it? It's really going to be, you know, it's going to be what you're known for no matter how far you make it and how long you fight in mixed martial arts. Certainly if you become a champion here at the XFC card or in the future for other organizations, that's going to be equal part what you're known for as well. But I'm sure you understand and have come to terms with the fact at this point in, in, in your life that it, it really is something that, that piques people's interest about you. And, you know, there are other people in MMA. It might not be necessarily a, a birth defect, but, you know, some part of their biography like Tim Kennedy or Brian Stan. After a while, it gets a little old being called an American hero all the time on the fight broadcasts, you know, that that's really the only thing or the very first thing that, that people know you for. Uh, are you developing at this point kind of a comfort level with having to talk about this all the time in interviews, or is it getting kind of old? What, where are you at on that? You know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head right there. Um, basically, you know, after a while I was fighting and they're like, oh, the, the one arm fighter, you know, that, and I was like, I got a little mad. I was like, why does everyone keep calling me that? Like, I don't want to be treated any different. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I didn't fight to be known as a one-armed fighter. I want to be known as a great fighter that happens to have one arm more so than a, a one-armed guy that's fighting. But the thing is, you know, it's a part of who I am. It's, it's me. It's how I am. And it's different. And it, it makes me stick out. And it draws interest from people. Uh, so I, I've come to terms that I'm always going to be known as that guy. You know, I go out to... Um, eat a cheeseburger and I'm that guy with one hand that's eating a cheeseburger, you know, it's just, it's just who I am. I'm different and I'm, I'm cool with it. You know, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the way I am. I'm, I'm proud of the way I am and uh, I'm different and it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. No. Well, that's, that's good because I think the higher profile you get in the sport, Nick, and, and the more attention that you get and if you win a championship coming up uh, here in the XFC cage, um, I think more and more and more, and you've already got plenty of uh, attention uh, in terms of, you know, the mixed martial arts media. Um, you know, it's, you're going to be probably answering the same questions over and over again. Well, well consider this kind of uh, the big long-form practice, okay? We'll, we'll do it that way. Let's look at it that way. Yeah, I don't care. You can ask me questions about it all day. It doesn't bother me. Wonderful. Um, now, forgive me on a piece of ignorance here. I know it's a congenital uh, birth defect, your arm. Um, what, what, what was it uh, specifically genetically that happened? Did it just not develop due to like lack of blood in utero? Was it, was it that kind of a condition, or what happened to the arm while you were um, in utero? Honestly, I, I've never looked into it. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah, I, I just kind of accepted things the way they are. You know, there's nothing I can do to change it, and I'm fine with it. You know, I'm, I'm just, 
I was born with one hand. Most people are born with two. Um, I didn't really look into the science of it or want to blame anyone for it. It was just something. It's just something different that happened to me, and whatever. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, yeah. Ten, fing- I, I, ten fingers are overrated. How so? <laughs> was that just a punchline? It's punch just saying, saying this. Um, there's this charity called Lucky Finn uh, Project. And they, uh, that's their slogan. It's for kids with limb differences and stuff like that. It's a really good charity. Um, yeah, you know, it's just, I just make do with what I have and, and I'm always trying to expand and learn and I'm, I'm just different, you know, and I, I don't need to know a reason why. I just know that I am and I accept it and I, I'm at peace with it. Sure, sure. Talk about, um, childhood and what that's like, uh, with your condition, um, you know, take us through it. I, I can imagine, you know, it, it's a difficulty and you, perhaps you were picked on and I don't know, maybe you first discovered that you can do some damage with that left arm because uh, some bully was, was uh, you know, getting out of line. Uh, you know, growing up, it wasn't all uh, sunshine and rainbows, but um, luckily I've, I've always had a good family. I've always had a good backbone. Uh, support. I wasn't raised. I wasn't babied as a kid. I wasn't like, oh, you only have one hand. Don't go outside. You're going to get hurt. You know, mm. like I was encouraged to go out and get dirty and be a boy and uh, wrestle around and play sports. And, and, you know, I always watched pro wrestling and I would always just wrestle with my friends. Like I didn't know how to really wrestle, but um, I've had the same friends since kindergarten and still today are my best friends. Um, so I grew up with like a good, uh, a good background, a support between friends and family. And, um, you know, obviously some people had their remarks or, or things to say to me, but I've always had a pretty outgoing personality. I've always been pretty well spoken. And if anyone had anything to say, I was, I was quick to get back at them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, do you find you know, that you violence, have to be... violence isn't isn't the answer to stuff like that, but when I was a kid, you know, I'm like, Oh, you wanna make fun of me, dude? I'll beat your ass. How about that? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know how to fight, but I was just I was just <laughs> tough. Like, you know, no one was really like, Oh, I'm gonna go pick on you or give you a wedgie. I'm like, dude, I'll punch you right in the face, you know? <laughs> sure. I was gonna ask you, I mean, it's almost like you have to sharpen your kind of verbal attack more than anything else because if you call someone's bluff on something like like if you call a bully's bluff, I mean that's probably ninety nine percent of the time an instant shutdown, an instant end to the situation. Yeah, I mean bullying is is a terrible thing. You know, when you're a kid, you don't you don't realize it until you're an adult. And um, you know, definitely people have have said some things that hurt my feelings and and made me cry. And you know, but uh, I've learned to have thick skin and. With the amount of people that do support me and, and don't judge me and, and are my friends, it's not, it's not, you know, I mean, I know I, I have all these people that do love me, so the people that don't like me or the people that hate me, I don't need them in my life. I don't need their acceptance. So I don't vie for it, and I don't let it really bother me that much. I ask this not to, you know, send any kind of a message that it's it's – it's okay to to have like street fights or anything like this, but more to see if it happened to you and if you kind of if there was a moment where you know you you developed that that instinct to talk right back to somebody and call bluff and you know tell people you'll whip their ass. Did it ever come down to it? Do you remember kind of your first full on schoolyard fight, let's say, or your first fight in childhood, and and did you discover something about your toughness even then? Uh, yeah, you know, um. Me and my friends, we used to just like to wrestle. Um, we watched, you know, WWE and didn't really know how to wrestle, but we just like goofing around. And uh, one day, some kid was talking some trash to me, and I was like, "Dude, I'll I'll, str- I'll straight up beat you up. I'm like, I don't know what you think's gonna happen." And he came at me, and I I um I went like Brutus the Barber Beefcake um choke on him. <laughs> mm-hmm. The sleeper, right? Yeah, I put him in the sleeper hold, and, uh, you know, like a rear naked choke with no technique. <laughs> and then from then on, I, I actually kind of had a, a, a bit of a reputation. But the thing about it is I've always been a nice guy. I've always been very nice to everyone. And always, like, been, um, had, like, a joking 
personality, always just very loose and relaxed. And it, it makes people like you, and and I, I never mind like um, breaking balls, you know. But um, when people, but no one really got. I mean, obviously people did, but not often did people get real personal with me. Right. Well, and I'm imagining that you, you know you, you talked about being kind of a well liked, knowing how to be funny, knowing how to mix it up. You know, you don't want even if he's got two arms, you don't want to beat up a guy like that. You know, I mean that's that in and of itself kind of probably wards off a lot of fights just having that personality. Yeah, I've never I've never been one to um to resort to that or like yeah. be like oh I want to fight. You know, like I love fighting, but that's why I do it in, in the cage against someone else that wants to. <laughs> and I don't, and I, not not to go too far on this, but I'm also a huge pro wrestling fan, so I need to follow this this thread here. Okay, you put you put the sleeper hold on this cat. Uh, did you put him to sleep? Uh, no, I didn't. But um, I kept choking him, and he kept like mm-hmm. screaming. No one knew about tapping out or anything. <laughs> I mean, there was in in wrestling, you know, you could tap out, but I'd be like, "You done?" And he'd be like. Oh. And I'd let go, and I'd be like, "You want me to pull this on you again?" And I like kept doing it, <laughs> and yep. then I just like I like he didn't pass out, but I like threw him on the ground, and I was like, "I can do that again if you want to." Here's the real question: If you were able to put him to sleep, would you have cut his hair? <laughs> if I had some scissors, I think he had a buzz cut though. It went kind of hard. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about those hedge those hedge clippers that that brood eye used to used to bring to the ring would would do much good against a crew cut. Yeah, they were they were very they were very practical. Yeah, <laughs> they certainly weren't. W- were you such They're a, a little over the edge? They were, yeah, yeah. Needless to say, Maybe were you he was a brood barbering? Eye? If he was barbering shrubbery or <laughs> yeah, right. Get, yeah, a, a mohawk for the shrubs or something. Uh, yeah. Did were you a big Brutus fan? Who, who was your who was your big guy growing up? No man, Bret Hart. The Hitman. Oh yeah, of course. If I'm not mistaken, you've come the out to Bret Hart's the music. The best there was and the best there ever will be. Oh, that's right. That's correct. Uh, you, did you come out to Bret Hart's he music? Gave his, he gave me his glasses one time, and I lost it. <laughs> I absolutely lost it. And the funny thing is, anyone that messed with him throughout his career, I hated. Like, um, like I was so against Shawn Michaels, but like he's a great, you know, he's a great wrestler, a great performer. Now that I'm an adult, but when I was a kid, I was like, why is this dude messing with my man with with Bret Hart, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. So this kind of so you were coming up ninety two, ninety three. We're talking about, right? Yeah, actually, a funny pro wrestling fact is that if you look up Shawn Michaels versus Diesel um, at WrestleMania, where they had Jenny McCarthy and Pam Anderson come out, Hartford, Connecticut, Anderson your home state. Down, it, it's on YouTube. When she's sitting down, um, you can see me in the background. I'm like nine years old. I got. Um, my diesel glove on. I'm um, just a little kid. It's kind of it's, it's really funny if you watch it. Oh man, that that's that's good to know. That was in your home state, so you made the trek there, right? Yeah, I was in Hartford. Now, you must have been disappointed then in the I Quit match with Bob Backlund because that was one of Bret Hart's weakest WrestleMania matches that you got to see that year. Oh yeah, yeah. I, you know, you, everyone has their on days and their off days. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> do you get them next time, hey man? Yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, one more pro wrestling note before we make the hardcore MMA fans throw up in their mouths. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get off pro. Well, hold on. Let, let me ask you about that. What, what do you get as far as pro wrestling and MMA? Because I try to, you know, I talk about it a lot on the air, and some people can't deal with it. Um, what, what's your sense? How's how's pro wrestling regarded in the in the MMA circles you travel in? It's different, man. It's, it's different. You got they're like. Oh, you know it's fake or whatever. I'm like those guys really hurt themselves doing that stuff, and it, it's it's different. Like it's not it's not MMA. MMA is a sport. Um, pro wrestling is entertainment, but it takes a lot of skill. If you don't like, it, you don't have to watch it. You know, um, if you can make the same sense, people shooting people in movies. It's like, well, they're not using a real gun, so it's stupid. You know, you yeah. you don't have to like everything that's out there, but you know, I I definitely have a lot of respect for it. Now. Does your childhood wrestling fandom, Nick, have anything to do with how you ended up the roommate in college of current WWE superstar Kurt Hawkins? No, no, it doesn't. He was just a wrestler, wrestler, and um, yeah, you know, we were we were friends for that. And I I used to think it was cool, you know, like I still do. I think it's awesome. I think he's an awesome wrestler, and um, you know, I used to go to all the shows and. 
it, I just I respect it a lot, and I know how hard he works and how much he puts into it, and and it's just cool to have a friend that's you know uh, following his dream like that. Now you guys are a couple of wrestling heads, college roommates, so you're watching Monday Night Raw, and then what do you know? After Raw, one one night, one week in 2005, the Ultimate Fighter comes on, and it sounds like from what I've read about your background, Nick, that was really your introduction to MMA in in a real way. Yeah, I um. I actually, I, from wrestling, I used to know, I, I was like, Ken, Ken Shamrock, I'm like, he does MMA, but I didn't understand it. And I watched him fight Tito the first time, and I was like, wow, this guy's good if he can beat up, you know, Ken Shamrock. And then I thought it was cool, but then I just kind of ignored it, and I didn't, because I didn't understand it. And then I watched, um, uh, I watched The Ultimate Fighter, and I, I watched it every week, and I really, started to understand it and and learn the sport and and get a great respect for it and i I fell in love with it you know i i i I watched it and i was like i have to i wasn't like i'm gonna do this right away i was like i'm gonna learn how to do this and then i learned and then i'm like okay i'm gonna fight and then i started fighting and things escalated from there to uh me fighting for xfc world title sure (laughs) would you say there was anything about the Ultimate Fighter or the UFC or the way the sport was presented on that show that appealed to a lifelong pro wrestling fan because it was pretty clear that they just grabbed a good old chunk of that WWE audience and and held on to it t- till today really I mean hundreds of thousands of people yeah it was just great because you you got to see the personalities um, you got to see what fighters are are actually like you know they're normal people um, some of them are kind of dicks and some of them are jokesters and. It's um, it, it was just great, but more importantly, I just love that as a wrestler, they were using wrestling to fight, and I thought that was really cool that you can, you know, because before that, I thought there was just, like, boxing, you know, and then um, I was like, oh, they're kicking and punching and using elbows and takedowns, and I was just like, my mind just, it just went crazy, like, and I was like, there's so much I can learn, and I just wanted to learn it and just soak it all in like a sponge. That, that's, that's wonderful. Because you had you had some chops on the high school wrestling mat. I guess your freshman year wasn't a great one as you kind of learned the ropes. But all, all told, I mean, tell us about your high school wrestling career. I mean, that, that is a linchpin of your MMA game today. Yeah, you know, I, I, I started as a freshman, and I, I wasn't very good. I was a 103-pounder. And I, I lost, like, my first 15 matches all by pin. And then I was, like... I had like my record was eight and twenty two, but technically I was two and twenty two because I had um well because I had six forfeits um because there was no one in the weight class, but I got pinned like seventeen eighteen times. It was it was rough, and you know I was a loser. I was a guy no one really expected something out of. My my high school wrestling coach always expected something out of me. Um, he never treated me any different. I was very lucky in that sense. Um, but I know what it's like to be a loser, and I never want to go back to that. And I said that year after that year, I said, I'm going to work hard all year, and I'm going to come back next year, and uh, I'm going to be a lot better. I didn't know I would be as good as I was the next year. I, I just kind of hoped that I'd win a couple more matches than I did, and I ended up placing my conference and having a winning mm-hmm. record and being one of the better guys on the team. And it really helped me appreciate the value of hard work more so than someone that does something and is immediately good at it. You know, I've never been that guy that's just phenomenal at something. When I start, I've been that guy that shows up and sticks with it and gets good at it because he wants to get good at it and keeps an open mind and works hard. After that, uh, what, 13th, 14th straight loss as a freshman, you must have been getting some looks like, Nick, this might not be for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, they were happy to have me on the team. I, I was wrestling varsity. We had no other, other guy on the team in my weight class, and I was good to get forfeits and stuff, so no one really encouraged me to quit. I mean, they... A lot of people that wrestle go through similar situations, maybe not as severe, but um, definitely my teammates uh, always had my back and and encouraged me to go to camps and, and get better. You know, even though I was getting you know I was getting killed, but it was a it was a learning experience definitely. 
Sure. Um, maybe people in maybe people in the, the audience were like, "What's this guy doing? Like, why is this kid wrestling?" But I don't pay attention to them. I don't care about them. You know, I, I care about the people that care about me. Certainly, certainly, yeah, and, and it's good to hear that you know you never really pick those vibes up from your teammates because um, you would think after a while they might be susceptible to, to saying something. But uh, it's excellent to hear that that you felt that unity throughout, and and obviously it, it paid dividends because you came back strong and, and kind of laid the foundation for uh, for the game that that we see exercised in the MMA cage today. Uh, speaking of yeah, you, my, as sort my of my high school res- my high school wrestling coach is just a great guy, and he um he was always he was very hard on me um. To succeed and 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 really push myself to to be as good as I could, you know, and I, I thank him for that very much. I went on I went on to wrestling college too, and I was captain of my team, and I was uh, a, a good college wrestler as well. Excellent. Now, speaking of you as a youth athlete, um, you know, getting involved in little league and getting involved in, a, in other athletic endeavors as a kid, are you aware of other great one-armed athletes or other one-armed athletes that have, um, or, you know, one-handed athletes that have made an impact, like Jim Abbott, the, the baseball pitcher. Uh, do, do you get to know, growing up with your condition, of yeah, other athletes I that was, did it? I, I often was encouraged to watch Jim Abbott, just to show me, you know, you can do this. Like, look at this guy. He's playing at the highest level, and, you know, he's thrown a no-hitter. <laughs> yeah. I met Jim Abbott twice. Oh, yeah? How'd that go? Ah, uh, nice guy, man. I was... It wasn't he. He definitely wouldn't remember it. He's probably met so many kids throughout all the years. You know him being as famous as he is. But I was young. I was like maybe like eight years old. You know, like and but it, it definitely had an impact on me. And and you know you you, you look at there. There's great at, athletes out there with limb differences, like uh, kickboxer Baxter Humby. He's nasty. Um, mm-hmm. He's got one hand, uh, world champion in, in kickboxing, and um, John Jacques Machado, nasty, oh, so good at jujitsu, it's ridiculous. And uh, you know, look at look at like dudes like Anthony Robles who won NCAA's with one leg. You know, anything's possible. It, it, you have barriers, but if if you if you look at that wall and stop, of course you're going to get nowhere, regardless if you if you have a limb difference or not. You got to look at that wall, and you got to either bust through it, climb over it, or walk around it. That's simple. And and if you work hard enough at anything, you're going to get good at it. Plain and simple. You do have to work harder, though, Nick. I don't know if I have to work harder because I um I've never had two hands, so I wouldn't know if it would be easier for me. Mm-hmm. But what I can tell you is that I work as hard as I can. I get anything more in term- I got in. This isn't this isn't like a hobby. This isn't something I'm like, oh, fighting this sucks. I have to go to practice. This is something that I love to do, and this is a lifestyle. And I bust my ass every day for this. You know, sure. Um, well, not been, a lot of people uh, could go through what I, I've gone through training wise through the years that I've gone through, and and worked as hard as I have, and everything I have, I I worked hard for. I wasn't given anything. And I think that adds uh, that certainly adds some character to to me and my story. In terms of work harder, clearly, you know, you wouldn't know what it would be like to to have two hands for yourself. But do you feel like you have to work harder than other guys you see in gyms and in, in, in the fight game? Um, you know, so in my my uh, my gym, I'm known as a, a hard worker. Yeah, I'm known as a guy that shows up and bust his ass and works hard, but I have other guys in the gym that, that you know, work hard too along with me, and that that's great. That's motivation for me that are willing to push themselves every day and are hungry. And, you know, I have guys that don't work as hard, and they're not as successful. <laughs> and it's just simple to look at it and just be like, you know, this is, this is it works. Working hard has its benefits. When you played baseball, what was the mechanics as far as dealing with the glove and, and throwing? Because I understood you played. Did you play infield? Yes, I did. I was an uh, um, all-star second baseman. What were the mechanics like of ball handling when you played the field? Catch, put the glove in my armpit, pull the ball out, and throw it. 
Wow. You, you must have it's gotten... Not, it's, not, it's not as fast as, you know, throwing it to your hand, but I can do it pretty fast. Still to this day, I haven't played baseball in years. I can still do it very fast. That's was that something that you had to learn yourself? I mean, was there any advice out there that you took, or any tips that you were able to get for for playing baseball w- without a hand? My family watched Jim Abbott, and they're like, "He does it like that, like this." And I was like, "And and I practiced, I practiced doing it that fast. It wasn't hmm. like one day I was like, oh, this is going to be the fastest <laughs> way.' And I yeah. wasn't necessarily good at it, you know. I mean, when you when you join Little League, you have to play." You know, that's a rule. They have to make you play, and I sucked, so they would always put me in right field because no one ever hits it to right field because everyone's a righty, and no one really hits it in the outfield when you're that young. And, you know, then the, I slowly moved to center field, and then, um, you know, I, I moved to first base and then second base. And that's that seemed to be your strongest position. How about at the plate? How about yeah, batting? For, first base, second base, I rotate back and forth, actually. Um I played How about at the plate? third base, though, but those were my two best positions. All right. And how about uh, at the plate as a batter? How did that work? Um, You know, I mean, I wasn't knocking them out of the park, but I actually have some per- decent power now that I'm a man, but I was always like a smaller kid anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'd always try to just aim it. I, I put my little arm over it, and I bat righty. Mm-hmm. And I always try to hit line drives through through the holes in the in the infield. Tell us about your late friend Abby Mestri. Uh, you've told the story before, and I know it really is um, you know sort of a a big impact moment in your life. Tell us about him. He was a pro fighter who who died, I believe, in a motorcycle crash. Yeah, um, he he passed away in a motorcycle accident. Um, he wasn't just a friend, he was a brother to me, and, uh, you know, he's one of the people, in, in, in life, I've always just kind of said, you know, I'm me, I do my own thing, but he was someone that I really looked up with, or I really looked up to, you know, like a big brother, um, and I learned a lot from him about, in, in life, and, you know, how to talk to people, he was the best in, of all time at talking to people, and, um, you know, he, he taught me a lot in that sense, and he, he was a fantastic fighter. I actually didn't, a lot of the times, SFC will say I'm an open fighter tryout winner, but yeah. I actually didn't I actually didn't win the, um, the open fighter tryouts. Uh, I went to the open fighter tryouts. I was a finalist, but Abby won the, the open fighter tryouts, and he won the SFC contract. Then he got the series of injuries. He never had the opportunity to... Um, fight for them, and then you know the accident happened, and it, it, it is very unfortunate. Um, they gave me the opportunity, and now I'm fighting for the title, and it really should be him fighting for the 145 pound title, and me fighting for the 155 pound title. Tell us about him as as a guy, uh, as as a person. What what would I have noticed if if I had the chance to meet him? Uh, at first off. Everyone loved Abby. Um, there's everyone knew him as Abby, um, and he was just like well loved by everyone. And and you know, I, like I said before, everyone loved him, uh, especially the ladies. Mm. <laughs> you know, he always had girls going after him, and he always had a big smile on his face and. You know, he could steal a guy's girlfriend, and the guy would still like him. That's how likable he was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, awesome. that. You know what? I'll I'll, let, I'll leave it at that. That is a perfect way to describe. Uh, you know, that that's that element of a guy's and, personality. And I I know for a fact that, that that's happened before, and the guy still liking him. So. <laughs> so that's a true there's, story. That's not just uh, some, an example. Yeah, there's a little there's a little science behind that, and uh, yeah, there's a it's a it's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> do you think um truly when you've had trouble getting fights in your MMA career that it came down to someone being scared to get beat up by someone with only one hand? Absolutely. Absolutely because when I fought amateur people would fight me and they're like, "Oh yeah, I'll fight that guy." And then I started beating everyone's ass and then all of a sudden, you know, it's an issue. Do you think um there's any foundation to a worry? 
that if you lost really badly in a fight, let's say if it was on national TV, let's say it was in the UFC, that that could be, a, uh, I don't know how to sensitively put this, Nick, a, a PR challenge, that, that, that they let someone into the cage with, with that clear disability, and uh, he had a difficult time. Yeah, I don't, I don't put any stress on myself or even think about that. I could get knocked out with one punch. I could lose in, in four seconds, but guess what? People, that's happened to people with two hands. You know, oh, yeah. anything can happen. Anything can happen in this sport. And I think at this stage in my career, at eight and zero oh, with seven finishes, I've already proven that I can compete. I've proven that I can. I can do this sport. You know, three wins in the XFC. I've proven that I can do it at a at a, at a high level. And if anyone, of course, you know, no one goes undefeated. Everyone loses. So. You know, when the day comes and I, I do lose a fight, obviously I could be the I could be number one in the world. I could be, you know, the best fighter in the world, and then lose one fight, and everyone's going to say I suck. Um, I know that's going to happen. I'm ready for it mentally. I'm I'm a mentally strong uh, person, and you know, the the best thing to do in that situation is go back to the drawing board, figure out what you did wrong, come back, fight, whoop someone else's ass, and everyone will forget about it. You're only as good as your, your last fight. Let's put aside opponents for your career in terms of considerations, difficulties getting fight. Let's talk about officials and you know uh, commissions. Um, has that been a challenge for you, getting commissions to sign off on allowing you to fight? Um, luckily, um, you know, I... Uh, I got in there before there was a commission in yeah. Massachusetts that used to be you could just fight if the promoter wants you to fight. You didn't even need blood work or anything. <laughs> yeah, not too long ago. Yeah, not not very long ago. So the promoters let me fight, and I was like, oh, they're going to commission? And I only had three amateur fights, but I, I wanted to go pro before the commission came and said, oh, well, you can fight, but you just should stay amateur. You know, I wanted to get in there and get that those pro fights. So by the time it came around, say, hey man, I'm already winning pro fights. You know, um, so I got that, and also um, the guys at Combat Sports Agency really uh, pushed hard and and fought the um, the athletic commissions that try to give me a hard time. They really had to talk with them about you know fairness and, and giving me a chance and. They gave me a chance, and I, I, I've shined. So after I started um, kicking butt, you know, they 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 kind of every commission just kind of approves me. Um, I know they had like a, a meeting about like a big mixed martial arts meeting, and they actually used me as the example, um, you know. And they say you got to take it on a case by case basis, but I think everyone deserves it, at, at least to have a chance. Totally. As you sensed, um, I'm I'm in Boston, Nick. So I remember when Massachusetts brought in, you know, MMA regulation. They were really late compared to some other states to do it. And, and for a state that had a lot of shows going on for years and years and years, going back yep. to the the late '90s, even. I mean, New England, you know, um, man, th- th- there's yeah, been a lot even, of. You didn't even need a couple of mouthies. You could. They were picking people out of the crowd. Yeah. And that was oh, in, absolutely. That was in 2009. Yeah, exactly, and that's the thing. It, it, this is not, uh, you know, mid to late '90s Wild West days. I mean, that was right up until recently. So you felt, it sounds like, if I'm picking picking up what you're throwing down there, you felt kind of like there was a race to get as much experience and fights under your belt as you could before sanctioning came in Massachusetts, where a lot of your fights were, so that you had tape to show people, and they, you know, they couldn't say anything. Yeah, that was that was it, and I, I did it. Now, with that accomplished. Um, I don't know if your management or yourself looking to the future even. I don't know if this is something you can even do logistically. Have you um, given any thought or consideration or has anyone um, representing you talked to Nevada, like a big state like that, about sanctioning? Because so far – I got no I got approved in Nevada. Oh, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. They, they're great people over there in, in Nevada. Um, but to be clear, you've never fought there, right? No, I've never, I've never fought there. That's but, that's interesting. In, now, does this go back to? I was going to transition into this. You might as well jump into it. Is that related, Nick, to when you tried out for the Ultimate Fighter? Yeah, yeah, I tried out for the Ultimate Fighter, and you know, I made it really far. And they took me out there, and I, they did all my tests for me. And uh, you know, I got sanctioned by the uh, um, Nevada State Athletic Commission, and you know, they just didn't end up using me on the show. I mean, it happens to a lot of people. 
um, I was only only four and zero at the time. You know, now I'm I'm eight and zero, and I've learned I was I was good back then. I thought I I, I would have done really well uh, on the show, but I'm even better now. I'm a, I'm a whole different animal now. Sure. And, uh, did, was Nevada um, just you know? Yeah, of course. Uh, we'll go. Or did they have to ask a lot of detailed questions? What was that process like? No, it was cool. They were, they were, they were. I think, um, you know, I, I, um, for the most part, the the uh, UFC handled that for me, or mm-hmm. or uh, the producers of the show, or whatever. But they, they didn't. I don't even remember being asked any questions, really. Wonderful. So this was 2011. You tried out for the 14th season of The Ultimate Fighter, and you you went pretty far, right? Tell tell us how far you went in terms of the tough tryout process. I mean, I won. I won the um, the. I mean, I I did the grappling, the the stand up, and the interview, and I passed all that. But then, you know, they just didn't end up taking me for the show. I I mean, I went out to Vegas again and stuff. But that you know that happens to a lot of people, and sure. it's their show. And if they didn't want to use me, they don't have to. <laughs> you know, certainly. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not bitter over the experience. Um, you know, I, I it would have been a great one, and and you know, I. It, no, I've re- I've read. It sucks. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, that would have been a tremendous opportunity, and that door isn't necessarily closed in the future as you yeah. build this undefeated campaign. And if you get some MMA gold strapped around your waist, I'm sure that would uh, pique some interest as well. Um, let me ask you about that tough experience, because I've read in some places that it came down to them not picking your weight for the show, yet you've said you'd fight, I think, at the weight they picked. I think it was the 145 season. Uh, is that not the is not necessarily the case? Did you ever get a straight answer? I don't even think they give guys straight answers necessarily in terms of why they don't get picked for the show. They don't have to. It's their show. If they want me, they want me. If they don't, they don't. You know, it's the only. W- That's the way I look at it. I, I just kind of accept that. And uh, 145. You know, I mean, is a weight class that I could do. I could. I could fight at 145. Um, I'm very comfortable at 155. I actually think I'm. I'm getting big for a 155 hunter. I have a new strength and conditioning mm-hmm. program that I'm on that's making me more explosive and making my legs enormous. <laughs> And uh, you know I, I'm I'm very comfortable at 155, so why would I kill myself to make that weight class? But for the opportunity, I was willing to do it. Uh, absolutely. Do you see? Uh, you have to. But I mean, when you think about a UFC career, when you think about getting into the UFC, well, well first of all, let me not let me not predis you know presuppose that. Do you see yourself in the UFC? And, and if so, how how long? Um. I don't know. I mean, I'm not that guy that uh, that makes those types of decisions. I know that right now, you know, it's the biggest organization in the world, and it's where most of the exposure and and the money is. And uh, I could I could hang with any one of those guys. You know, I, I could fight anyone in the world, and it would it would be a great fight. I I know how good I am, um, and you guys are gonna find out on December seventh, XFC has just been so great to me. Uh, you know, up and coming organization and and they have a um they have a good thing going where they're getting prospects and I'm fighting a very tough veteran like Eric who could hang with anyone in the UFC. Um and it, it would be a great fight too. And, you know, there's a lot of challenges right here but you know, I mean the the UFC definitely is 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 you know, the the pinnacle right there and I would love to fight some of those guys in there and and you guys would be really surprised at, at how good I'm I'm going to do. Well, I've been personally uh blown away. I'd certainly heard about you um before you got on the XFC, which is really your first televised fights uh coming up in the New England circuit and and getting the string of submission wins that you were able to put together. Um, and it was just, you know, it was really interesting to hear about someone who has your, your situation yet at the same time is able to pull off a wide array of, of submissions from Rick Chokes to arm bars. But when you hit that heel hook on Dennis Hernandez at XFC 15, December of 2011, it was sort of a relevatory. It was, I almost felt like not only, you know, had, had you found a way around not having a hand, but you actually learned the techniques that, that were most effective. Like you, you perfectly honed your game to, 
to just put yourself in zones where that didn't make any difference whatsoever and you avoided all the areas where it could be a problem. Yeah, you know, great coaching. And XFC 17, a majority decision win over Chris Coggins, and you came back from tremendous adversity. As we close out the interview here, we'll close with your uh, XFC fights. Take us through that point where you were trapped in a rear naked choke uh, by Coggins and, and toughed through. That was just an extra sort of element that we got to learn about, about your game and what you bring to the table. Yeah, I, I learned a lot in that fight. Um, you know, I won the first round, definitely, um, pretty decisively. And, you know, uh, there, were, there, were, there were little things, you know, I, that, that Coggins um, is a gamer and he came to fight and he came to throw down. And he's tough. Um, it wasn't my best day. You know, I wasn't feeling good. To I wasn't sick or anything. I just wasn't into it. I was having an off day. Um, and he really pushed it, pushed it on me, and, and made it hard for me. Um, yeah. And uh, even a one-hour time change was like weird for me. Uh, this time I'll be ready for it. But um, you know, he he's just a tough gamer and he put me in that choke and you know it, it was tight but this is my job and, and I just think about how hard I work and everything I put into it and you know you have one bad day on the job you don't quit your job you know you push through it and you, you keep doing work and um uh I went I went back to the corner after that round and my head coach uh Jeremy Lewishevsky runs uh, Fighting Arts Academy in, in Springfield, Mass. Um, he just he just kept me very calm and gave me some good advice, and I went out and won the third round. All the way up till then, it was all first round stoppages, be it your TKO and your debut, to all the other submissions I mentioned. What what did you learn about yourself going the distance that way in a very close fight that ended up being a majority decision? Yeah, I have I have that war under my belt, so yeah. You know, you you can't you can't put a price on experience. And XFC 19, August of this year, you knock out David Mays with a knee in two minutes. And uh, you know, submissions had been such a clear uh, advantage, such a clear uh, strength for you, rather in, in fights. And you'd done so well getting into those favorable positions. I have to say, Nick, I did not see that coming. That that knee was that something. Uh, that surprised you to land, or did you come in knowing you had knockout power in your knees? I'd imagine uh, there was uh, you were just as happy to see it as everybody else, obviously. But were you surprised at all? No, not at all. Um, I knew how he fought. He he's a great fighter, but um, I knew with my my height advantage and my reach that I had, and um, I uh, that I would I would be able to dictate the striking game and when he he shot i knew i'd be able to get the knee up and and i and my coach predicted a knee knockout before before the you know as soon as we watched the video he said you're gonna knock this guy out with a knee mm. and i just kind of listened to everything my coaches tell me to do because that's what they're around for <laughs> you know yeah. um and it, it, it just works out perfectly um i hit hard if you watch um my fights, I, I hurt everyone um, standing in every fight I've ever been in where there's an exchange. Um, I have I have one punch knockout power. I haven't shown it yet, but I do. And I kick hard and I knee hard. And, um, you know, I've just, I've just always tried to win fights as easy as possible, and a lot of the times that easy win is on the ground. So I'm not going to go in and get banged up and beat up if I can just take someone down and choke them real quick. <laughs> Absolutely, and leave leave us with this because if you get this win and you get a title strapped around your waist in a televised fight, um, it seems to me that that is a launching off point for for other things in the sport. Do you spend any time? And be honest, I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying that because you do this that somehow you're sacrificing the goal in front of you. But do you spend any time thinking about how far you can go? Does it feel limitless or? Do you constantly tell yourself this? If I accomplish this, I'll be a happy man. Or is there any such thing like that in your life? There's no such thing as as me ever being happy with what I accomplish. <laughs> really? 
you know, I, I mean, eh, well, I'm I'm proud of the things that I have accomplished, but it's never enough for me. Um, there is no limit on what I can do and what I can accomplish and how far I can go. And some people don't believe it. Some people do. You know, the people that know me know how far I can go in this sport, and, and the, the sky is the limit. You know, the, there there is no limit. And, you know, goal, fight, win, become a champion. Okay, you're a champion. Guess what? Time to defend it. This guy defended it this many times. Well, guess what? I want to defend it this many times. I want to win and win and win, and I want to be the greatest. I want to be the, the, the best that ever did it. You know, I want to be the best. I can be tapping to my full um, potential, and, you know, I want to be the best in the world, and I don't sell myself short of any of my goals. And whether, you know, anyone believes that's a reasonable or unreasonable goal, it's, it's my goal, and I, I'm working my ass off for it, and it's paid off pretty well so far. It has been a pleasure watching it develop, Nick, and uh, we look forward in the MMA world to seeing it continue. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time tonight. Uh, it's such extensive time helping us get to know you and uh, get an idea of what goes into uh, the efforts we're seeing from you in the MMA cage. Uh, thanks a lot yep. for your time, Nick. And, and make sure to watch XFC next Friday, December 7th, and you're going to see a great fight, and you're going to see the best Nick Newell you've ever seen. The preceding show is a TJ DeSantis production and is property of the Sure Dog Radio Network. Its content is intended for private use only. The preceding content was a TJ DeSantis production and is property of the Sure Dog Radio Network. All of today's content will be available at the radio section of SureDog.com and the iTunes Music Store under podcasts. This is the global authority in mixed martial arts. The one, the only, the Sure Dog Radio Network.